floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so my name's Jim. I'm, I'm actually representing Logical Clocks. We have a startup commercializing this work. So we have our name down here at the bottom corner. Uh, I'm going to talk, so it, a few of you have heard of Hops. A lot of you haven't. Uh, we're not based in the valley, I guess. You know, we're European. We're a European distribution of Hadoop, and we try to get the word out there. Uh, we do our best, but you know. Um, you should have heard of us, I guess, if you read a lot of the, 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 you know, the blogosphere, because we have actually the fastest distribution of Hadoop by a, a good margin. So we had a paper earlier this year at Usenix Fast, where uh, in collaboration with Spotify, so on Spotify's workload, their Hadoop workload, uh, we worked with Oracle on this as well. Uh, but we, we had 16 times the throughput of HDFS, the Hadoop file system. So we got about 1.2 million operations per second. And we can have clusters that are more than an order of magnitude larger than the existing Hadoop clusters. So, you know, 37 times the number of files is a reasonably conservative estimate of how big we can go. Um, recently, the last couple of weeks, we won the IEEE scale challenge for this year. So, like, we have a bunch of, um, we've done a lot of research over a number of years to get the, uh, the underlying file system to this level. And the way we did it was that if you're familiar with Hadoop, there's a, in the Hadoop file system, you have something called a name node, which stores the metadata for the file system. So we're distributed systems uh, researchers. What we did was we moved the, main, the name node state from the heap of a JVM into an in-memory distributed database. And basically that helped us to scale out. It's a new SQL database called MySQL Cluster. Now, I'm not here to talk about that today. If you want to read up on it, you can go to our website or we have papers and plenty of uh, presentations to look at. I'm going to talk about uh, streaming on our platform. So streaming as a service, uh, in particular, uh, Spark and Flink. They're the kind of main platforms that we support. Uh, we also support Kafka as a service, and um, we're working hard on TensorFlow right now. So this is running in production. We're running, uh, we have a cluster in northern Sweden in Luleå. We have about 150 users. And um, uh, we have a number of users doing uh, streaming right now. So I'm gonna, what I'm going to talk about is the journey we had in how do, how do you get to a, like a production-ready streaming platform? What do we need to add to Hops to, to bring it up to, to speed? So the one thing that, that, that is interesting about Sweden is you know, that labor is expensive, right? So cleaners, taxi drivers, sysadmins, they're very expensive. Um, so what we wanted to build was a self-service streaming platform. And that means that users, like this is Obama here in case you're wondering who it is. Uh, we want to help him to spark up by himself with a bit of flink. That should be flint, but flink, whatever. OK, bad joke. So the basics of a stream processing platform are that you're going to have some streaming engine. Maybe it's going to be flink or spark. Um, there's other ones like uh, data torrents product, Apex, uh, which I heard a talk about earlier. Um, but they're going to take data in. There's going to be ingress, some pipe bringing data in from its source. And then you're going to write your data out somewhere, probably to a sync. But there's more services. A basic uh, streaming platform will have some way of looking at online logs. So you're going to have to debug applications as they're running. So you want them to be able to write to some log where you can read the logs as the streaming app is running. Similarly, you want to be able to monitor that application as it's running. So you need to be able to get notifications if something's going wrong. You might want to look at the you know, memory utilization, the CPU utilization, if it's lagging or not. Um, and then your streaming application will also have to um, support high availability. So if it crashes, it should restart and it should reprocess any data that it missed. And typically, streaming engines will, will need some form of storage on which to write uh, checkpoints, but also a write-ahead log. So they're the typical mechanisms used to recover from failures. You're going to have a write-ahead log and then some checkpoints that you'll recover from, and then you may go back to Kafka or wherever to, to process any data that you missed. So that's, that's a basic stream platform, uh, but what we had to do is we had wanted to build a platform around Hops. Um, so that's our kind of our cloud uh, that we're building on. And we looked at Kafka basically for the, uh, for the pipe where the data is coming in. Uh, we looked at a lot of different tools for how to do monitoring, and we ended up on Grafana and InfluxDB. I know there are not lots of other ones like Prometheus and so on. Um, I'm only going to talk about the ones that we've looked at. Uh, we looked at Elk Stack, so Elastic, Logstash, and Kibana for the logging and for doing UI. Uh, so if you're doing any interactive analytics of, of data maybe produced by your streaming platform, we're supporting Jupyter and Zeppelin. Now, there are a number of other platforms out there. Uh, these are all open source stuff, so the whole platform is open source, so that was a kind of a prerequisite for us at the beginning. 
Okay, so this is our platform. If you if you want to look at it, I don't know if we can see that particularly well. Um, resolution's a bit off, but we're basically supporting Kafka as a pipe for for incoming data. You can write your streaming app in Flink or Spark. We support uh, our HDFS compliant, so it's a drop-in replacement for HDFS, HopsFS, and we also support Yarn. Uh, currently, we're at version 2.7.3 of Hadoop. And uh, we support also structured streaming, so you can write your Spark application to Parquet and then do analytics directly from Parquet. I'll give an example. I'll do a demo of that later. Uh, and then finally, for logging and monitoring, I'm going to talk a bit about Elastic and Kibana that we use for logging and then Grafana InfluxDB for monitoring. Now, we also support MySQL cluster at the back end, so you can use that if you want to as a, as a sync. Typically, people don't, but it's there. The other thing that's interesting for, from our perspective, and I guess from a lot of people in the room, is that we have this new law coming into effect next year, GDPR, and it, it is a law, right? And it will come into effect then, and, and I think a lot of people are in denial of the implications of it. So it has implications for sensitive data, private data, you have to think about issues like data retention. Um, you have to you know, have auditing for, for da uh, data. And, you and then pr citizens have rights. You, know, you have right to be forgotten and so on. So this has a lot of implications uh, for how you build data processing platforms. And in particular, you have the issue of privacy by design. So that's kind of a requirement of GDPR. So how do you, you ensure that your system will support privacy uh, in its actual architecture? So I'm going to talk a bit about the, how we do that. Um, we basically have a number of new abstractions that we've introduced into Hadoop, and they make it easier for us to, to support multiple users on the same platform, so multiple tenants. So I'm going to talk about multi-tenancy for stream processing. So the first abstraction we have is something called a project, and what a project is is, is basically a GitHub project. So if you want to have a project, you can create it. It's quick and cheap to create. You can uh, manage the project if you're the owner of the project. You can have data sets in your project. You can add members to your project, remove them. Uh, I'm going to actually spit over and do a little demo while we're doing this so you, you get a, a feel for what I'm talking about. So actually, let me go to a, a new project. This one I haven't logged in here. So we just create a new one here. So, okay. So it's actually, we have, we've got a bunch of tours here. I'm just going to close the tour for the beginning. But basically, you have projects in your platform. So if I want to create a new one called bbuzz here, um, you just create it like that. We had a number of services. And my projects are going to add up here on the right-hand side. So a project is a unit of isolation. So any programs I run within it will be sandboxed within that uh, environment. And I won't be able to copy data out of the project if, if I don't have a role that's allowed to do that. So I'm not a data owner. And uh, the projects will basically be cheap and dirty. So the equivalent of clusters, right? If you're running an S3 or Amazon, or if you're running on Azure, uh, typically you would spin up a cluster to do this. It would be your kind of unit of isolation. But this is a managed platform. So for us, a project is uh, the unit of isolation and kind of the, the unit within you do your work. So when you have a project, what we also want to be able to do is share your data sets across projects. Because I said already, it's like a, a, a unit of isolation. But what if I, uh, if I have a data set? It could be very large. And I'd like to share it with another project. I don't want to have to copy the data. And typically, that's what you would do in a, um, you know, a, a, a different environment where you, you're worried about maybe allowing users access to data. They might copy it to some place they're not allowed to copy it to. So if I create a data set, let's create two projects here. Another one here, we close that. I'll just turn off these tours for the moment. So I'm just creating a second project called Hello. And I'm going to go in. Now I'm inside the project Hello. Can you see that there? Yeah, that's OK, I think. I'll just make it full screen. OK, so what I'm going to do is just create a little data set here. I'll call it My, my Data. Now, that data set was searchable, but I can share it by basically right-clicking on it. I can share it with the other project that I created earlier, Bebo's. And uh, that's all I basically need to do. So it's kind of like Dropbox to share the data set. If I go back to my other project, this one here, Bebo's, what we'll see happens is that it appeared in here. So this is the data set from Hello. I can click on it to say, fine, I accept that, because I didn't ask for it. I had to ask me if I want to include it. And that's basically sharing data set security between projects. So we could have shared that data set write-only, or read-write, or, or read-only. 
but it didn't cost, the, for each project you also have quotas, I'll talk about it in a minute, but it's not going to add to the quota of this project, right? it's not going to add to the amount of uh, space that I consume. So we're sharing data is not copying data, it's basically um, linking, in this case, a HDFS data set across two projects. I'll show later on that we can do the same thing for Kafka topics, an example. Now, our platform supports uh, Flink and Spark, as I mentioned already. We also support TensorFlow, Spark and TensorFlow, um, and Kafka. But we're, not, we're not supporting MapReduce right now. Um, we haven't had any uh, demand for it, even though it's obviously part of the platform and it works. But in the UI, we're not even supporting it. Um, I don't know. There's, there's very little demand for it. So then the other thing that you need to do in the, if you're going to have a UI-driven platform like we have is you have to have notebooks at some level. So we started out supporting just Zeppelin, and we found that there are a lot of data scientists and Python people who just want to use Jupyter. So we spent a lot of effort uh, adding Jupyter to it. And then the other way you can run jobs is you can r launch them in, a, in a, uh, a, a job launcher. I can jump back and we can have a quick look at a job here. So now I'm inside a project here. So the jobs basically look like these ones here. Um, you can create a new job. Um, you can pick a name for it, pick your platform, TensorFlow, Spark, Flink and so on, and that, those jobs can then be launched, uh, it's like a, a job scheduler, like you would have in, in Uzi and things like that, you can have them launch at particular times, uh, scheduled. Um, there's no way of chaining them together right now, but it's basically a, a, set, a way for launching and managing jobs. Okay. Another thing that Python, so Python is, is affecting everything we're doing because Python is growing so much in use on, on Hadoop platforms that, um, Python users demand access to different versions of libraries. And currently, if you're running in a Hadoop-style environment and you're running with Scala or Java, you can just build a big fat jar with all your dependencies and run it, and you have no problems. But in Python, they don't have support for building fat jars, Uber jars. You can have eggs, but eggs may have dependencies on other eggs, and there's no way of packaging them together, uh, no easy way for users. So. What we've been doing a lot of with is adding support for Conda to our abstractions. So I don't know if you've heard of Conda. Conda is basically a package manager for Python. I'll just go back and show you how it works here. Um, so here I have a, uh, a particular project. I don't know if you can see it on the screen there. It's a little bit. I can zoom in a bit, I guess. So I can search for uh, a library in Conda. In, so I just search for Panda. And it goes out to the net, and then I can pick my version, let's say I take the Panda data reader, and then that gets installed. So here I have some libraries that were installed earlier on. This one is currently installing, you can see, but Panda SQL was installed earlier on. So what's happening here is that each project can have their own libraries, their own version of TensorFlow, their own uh, version of NumPy. And um, the way we're doing it is that we're actually copying the, we're creating a virtual environment on every node in the, in the system. So we have an agent running on every node in the system. They get commands to basically say create an environment for this project. And then they'll get commands like install this particular library for this Conda environment. And when your jobs launch on PySpark or in TensorFlow, then they launch within that Conda environment. Uh, no other Hadoop distro supports anything like this currently. Okay, I'm going to move on a bit now to, um, I talked about projects already, but let's think of it from more an abstract perspective, and then I'll look at an example, a use case that we have with an IoT company. So a project is basically a grouping of users and data. So here I can see three different users and four different data sets or data sources. So we can have Kafka topics, we can have a, a database, for example, in Hive, or you could have a subtree in HDFS. So if you draw any line around those users and, and data sets, you get a project. So that's the only restriction here is that a project, sorry, a data set has to have a home project. But otherwise, you can draw any lines around these whatever way you want. So the, you know, when, you, when you set up in a company, you might have one project where everyone in the company is a member of it with a company database. And then when teams want to work on different activities or maybe different departments would have their own projects, um, but it becomes quite a natural way of assigning responsibility and ownership within an organization. So 
Uh, as I mentioned, we work with Spotify quite a lot, and you may know that they're moving towards Google Cloud. So one of the big problems they had was lots of orphaned workflows and data sets. So the workflows are running every day, every hour. Nobody knew who, who, who'd run it. You know, people, they have, they have turnover within the company. The same goes for data sets. You know, who's responsible for that? So in our particular model, uh, there's always going to be an owner for a project, and it'll be quite clear. If that person leaves an organization, you can find someone to take over that role. Okay, so I'm going to give an example of a, an IoT platform that we're working with a, a, an IoT vendor in, in Stockholm. And what they're doing is they have, they have IoT devices out at like, you know, fa factories or on cruise ships or lots of different places, and they have gateways at, at off-site. And the, the gateways talk to a number of cloud servers that aggregate the data, and then they want to pull all this data into a, you know, a data lake platform where they can give access to their users to do analysis of the, of the IoT data. Now, so the, the main requirement here is the multi-tenancy one. So you could run a different cluster for every company that you're supporting, um, but in this case, we want to support a multi-tenant platform where all the customers can run on the same single platform. Now, in reality, uh, it's going to be a little bit more complex than this. This company have customers on AWS, on Google Cloud, on, on uh, uh, Azure, and uh, you need to bring all those together into the same uh, platform. So this is the way we do it with our abstractions. Remember, we have these projects, data sets, and users. The, the company has a, a Kafka topic for taking all the data in from the sensors, and that data will flow into this Kafka topic. For every company, so if we have a company, Acme, we'll have a project, and that project will have data sets uh, in HDFS, but also topic in Kafka that you can see there. So the the first streaming application takes the data coming in and then redirects it to each company's topic and, and data set. And then the company itself can manage access to that data. So they can um, add the users that they want to, to do an a an analytics on it and, and so on. The, company, the IoT company itself can then generate uh, you know, generic analytics reports and sell them to companies. Uh, but companies will often want to do their own custom analytics, which they can do in our platform. So the alternative to this, if you were thinking, oh, I'm going to do this in S3, you might say, well, OK, we would, you know, we'll write our data to a bucket in S3, and uh, we'll give access to the company. But in that case, the company loses control of the data. They're basically giving it to the company. Um, so this way, the, company, the IT company retain ownership of their data and access to it. So one thing I didn't mention about users and projects is that we have roles. Now, um, you know, when we talk to different users in different uh, domains, they all want to have lots and lots of different roles. GDPR talks specifically about two particular roles, a data controller, which we call a data owner, and then a data processor, so somebody who's doing anal an analysis on the actual data. So in our case, the data owner is able to import data into a project, export it out, so they're responsible for the data. They're also responsible for adding and removing people from the project and sharing data or topics in Kafka between projects. Data processors or data scientists just do analytics, so they can upload jars, they can look at their um, logs that they've generated, but they can't copy data anywhere. So what's kind of unique in our platform compared to others is that the users do all this management themselves. You don't need to talk to a, a sysadmin who will add some rules in, in Ranger or in um, Sentry. Basically, users can do all this work by themselves uh, in a kind of manner that's familiar to them, you know, Git style, I guess. Um, I mentioned this already, but projects have quotas. So because we have all our metadata in our own database, uh, we can extend that as we want to. And one thing we added was um, quotas to Yarn. So you don't have quotas naturally in Yarn. We've added them. So basically, when a container starts, when a container stops, we, we can uh, increment the time taken within the database and, and charge that to a project. And I guess one interesting feature of that is once you have quotas, it becomes uh, an easy mechanism w with which you can handle elastic demand on your cluster. So in our cluster in northern Sweden, if, the, if it's highly loaded, the price goes up. And if it's lowly loaded, the price goes down. And that way, users sh can hopefully uh, expand and shrink their demand based on the, the time of day. Um, OK. So I'm going to look at the, the, the tooling that we've built around uh, Hopsworks, our platform. So we, we're building, as I said before, on our, our Hadoop distribution called Hops Hadoop. And we added Kafka, um, the Elk stack, and Grafana, InfluxDB, and Jupyter. 
as well as Zeppelin. And all of this is actually multi-tenant. So um, you, these services themselves, some of them support authentication and authorization, some of them don't. Uh, we front them with uh, reverse proxies, so reverse proxies, reverse WebSocket proxies, where we can do the actual access control uh, as necessary. Um, but if you look at Kafka, uh, this is not easy to read, so I'll do a demo instead. Maybe a bit easier. Okay, so let's go to Kafka here. There's a crash dummy there. Um, okay. Right, one second here. So Google Chrome has appeared to crash. Let me try. You what? No. <laughs> okay. There's there's NetBeans decide to start me there. All right, one second. Okay. Here we go. Kafka. All right. Let me just make it. I think it's a full screen thing. This is um this is Kafka on in a project. The project I created earlier on called BitBuzz. There goes NetBeans. Okay. I admit I use NetBeans. Um okay. So what if you're you're running Kafka you'll you'll probably be using something like um Confluence data platform or maybe e EMR. Um, but you're probably familiar with the notion that topics typically have a, a schema associated with them. So if you're going to push data into a topic, um, often it's useful to have a schema. So we're supporting the same as Confluent, an Avro schema registry for topics. So each topic, let's say I create a topic here called uh, Steve, because he's the heckler down at the back. And um, I can pick a schema to associate it with it. And schemas can be versioned, of course. You can upgrade them. So, so now I've basically created a topic. Now, if you work on any other Hadoop platform, that's a non-trivial thing to do. You know, you're going to probably talk to an administrator to do it for you. Um, to give access to other people outside of this project, uh, the ability to read or write to that topic would also be a, a painful experience. In our case, I can just select another project and that project can then, um, so it was the project I created earlier on, that project, hello, can now uh, read or write to that topic. If I wanted to get more funky with the permissions, I can get into the ACLs that are supported by um, Confluent. Uh, they're actually part of Kafka itself, not just Confluent. But typically, we've never experienced anyone want to actually get that low level, right? So you can, you can do quite a lot with these simple abstractions of uh, data owner, data uh, scientist, and then um, sharing topics across projects. So if I go back to the Hello project, we'll see that that topic appears in here. This is Steve. So now I can write projects that can access that particular project. If any questions, just shout or heckle. That's cool. Um, OK. So the, some of our experience with working with Kafka and Spark Streaming or Flink, it, it doesn't really matter is that if you're going to provide a self-service UI, the question is, what do you want users to be able to change? What do you want them to be able to optimize? There's lots of things in Kafka you can change. You can change data retention periods. You, you have quotas now uh, recently in, in Kafka where you can specify the amount of data that can be read and written from a topic. Basically, we're only providing two metrics they can tune. One is, how many topics do I have in my project? And then, how many partitions do I have per topic? And you can go a long way with this. So typically, if you're building a streaming app, Often, you'll try and match the number of executors with the number of partitions. That's a pretty straightforward thing to do. And then you want to make sure that the data that you're reading and writing, or you're writing, that's being written to your topics is balanced across the, the partitions, so that no executors are doing a lot more work than other executors, that you want like some balance there. So if, if users get that far that they can do this and they still need further optimization, then you can do it offline with an, with an administrator. But typically, this is. Um, we found that this is enough to give users for, for self-service. So logging was the next thing um, that, I, that I mentioned, that, that Yarn, if you work on, on Yarn as your cluster manager, and we, we use Yarn, and if you're running a Spark streaming or a Flink streaming job and it's writing to your logs in Yarn, they will only get aggregated when the application completes, so when the application finishes. And that's pretty useless if you're in a in a Yarn environment, because you want to get the logs as they're being produced. So what you need to do is you need to add some kind of support for collecting logs. And we looked at a bunch of different ways of doing it, and we, we ended up looking at Logstash, Elastic, and Kibana. And the way to do it if you're writing a simple Spark application is you, we, we ought to configure Log4j and Spark, for example, that it will just write to Logstash. So the user doesn't even need to think about it. They just go Log4j info or debug, and it, it ends up in, in uh, 
in their particular logs that we'll, we'll see an example of later on. Okay, it kind of looks like that then. I'll, I'll do, do a demo of it in a, in a minute. Then the other one is monitoring. So um, if you're familiar with Spark, this is for Spark in particular. It has quite good uh, support for, for monitoring. You can supply a metrics.properties file when you launch a Spark job. And what the Spark job will do is it will write its metrics. So things like uh, related to the JVM, uh, heap size, usage. You can, you can extend it to your own, add your own custom metrics as well. But basically, you can configure it to write to JMX, Graphite, or to servlet, CSV, or console, or even a log for J output. So in our case, we're writing to a, a Graphite sync. And Graphite is actually just InfluxDB. So there's no Graphite server. It's just an InfluxDB server. Um, the other ways of getting doing resource monitoring for your applications, at least in Spark, in the latest version, is you can, for any given um, Spark application, a structured streaming application, you can write a structured query listener. And that can, um, for example, write to Kafka if you want as well. And uh, you can inspect from a Kafka topic, or you can write to, um, again, the same graphite sync. If you're running many uh, queries within a single Spark session, so many structured streaming queries within the same session, you can use the streaming query listener to do um, something similar. Okay, I'll, I'll do a demo of this in a second. And then we do support notebooks. Um, it may not seem relevant, but you know, at some level you're going to somehow do an analysis of the data coming out. You may have a, a, a database, or you may use Kafka as a, a sync. Uh, and from there, then you, you, you serve your data to your, to your users. But you can also do quite a lot with just Zeppelin and, and Jupyter. And we support both of them. So Jupyter, just to, to give you an idea of, of the kind of challenges you have with supporting a notebook, uh, this is a web application. And if you allow users to run Spark in client mode, or Flink uh, for that matter, um, what will happen is that they can launch drivers on the same server as your web application server. And if you run a workshop with 30 or 40 people and they're all running drivers with four or eight gigabytes, then you can have trouble. And we did to begin with. So what we did was we moved over to using um, a REST server in particular for Spark called Livy. So the driver is never launched locally on the web application server. Instead, it's launched on the ARN cluster. And if you are familiar with Jupyter, there's a, a kernel called Spark Magic that Windows Azure uses. We're also using the same one. Um, but then we had some issues in both in Zeppelin and, and Jupyter related to how can we get our notebooks to be you know, visible across all users and across all instances of our web application. And the simple solution is to put them in HDFS. Um, but there was no uh, contents manager for Jupyter for HDFS, so we wrote one, and the same goes for, for Zeppelin. So that code is available if you're interested in um, GitHub. OK, so Livy kind of looks like this. You, know, you basically have a REST API. And then, uh, in our case, the Jupyter kernel or the, the, the Zeppelin interpreter talk to Livy and, and uh, run the jobs and out in Yarn. OK, let's go back and have a quick look at, at some of those things then I was talking about. Right. So I'm going to do a tour, I think, to just to generate some of them here. Uh, so I'll do a... a, a um, a Kafka tour, because this is supposed to be about streaming. So what I clicked on was start the tour. We, we have a number of tours, but we're, we're going to add more tours. Um, you can see we have uh, tours for Spark and Kafka there. But I'm going to do the, the Kafka tour just to begin with. So what it's doing, I'm just going to click Next and follow along. It's going to create a schema for me, an Avro schema. It's just filled one in for me there. It's going to validate the schema. That's done. And now it's going to create a topic. I did this already, so I'm just going to click through it. Um, you can change the number of partitions there. And now it's going to create a job. So firstly, it's going to create a, a, in this case, it's going to be a Spark producer. It's going to write to that Kafka topic that I created. Um, it's just picking out a jar file from, the, from HDFS there. That jar file actually had the, um, the class path in its manifest, so it picked that out. And then these are the configuration parameters for, for Yarn. So just that one's created. Now I'm going to create a consumer, a consumer name the jar file, and then the uh, name of the class. And you can see here we have the, an argument to it called consumer. All this code is on GitHub if you're curious. And then I'm going to run it. OK, so I'll just run the, so this is our pricing model that I mentioned, the uh, 1x. 
and then I'm going to launch the consumer. So it's still 1x because I have quite low load. Okay, so they're running now. Um, let me just show you the UI. So when the job starts running, you can basically inspect the Spark UI for your job. You can go to Yarn to have a look at the job. You can go to Gibana to have a look at the logs being written. Um, in th what's interesting with Kibana actually is that if you, if you, you can actually use Kibana to do graphing. You know, you can use Log4j to just to write out some state that you're interested in your application, and then you can just visualize it by um, using built-in visualization tools in Kibana. And then we have metrics. Um, there's not that many metrics on this side, but there's more on the consumer. So I can go back to the consumer and see our consumers running here. In this case, this is Spark Structured Streaming. So you're going you're to have this SQL tab in, in Spark Structured Streaming that you don't have in normal streaming. And then the metrics, if I go back, we can see, yeah, we can see a bunch of executors have run and they've written to HDFS. And what this has done, actually, in this example, it's writing to a, um, a Parquet file. That's this one here. Or is it this one here? And um, so this, this has basically a bunch of Parquet files in there. So I could go and run it on Zeppelin, but I've run it earlier, and I'm running out of time. So I'll just show you what I did earlier. Oh, that was the one that crashed. OK. Let's go back here. <laughs> I can log in as the admin here. I guess there's the user here. OK, no, it wasn't that user, was it? It was a different user. I have too many accounts on here. OK. So. Yeah, I'll just pull this one up. So this is basically doing analytics on the on this, uh, the Spark st structured streaming file as as the data is coming in, and you can you can even do an, like an Angular front end to refresh that if you want to while it's going in. Okay, I want to just talk a little bit because I have only a few minutes left to to talk about um, an API we've added here to make it easier to write streaming applications. Here we go. Okay, so this is a simple Spark st structured streaming program you'll see here. You'll see it on the Databricks blog. It basically says you need to have a query, you need to have an input source, an output sync. Um, you need to trigger the query periodically, and you need to say where, where you're going to write your checkpoints to. And you think, okay, that's a nice example, but there's quite a lot of stuff missing from it. Um, for example, you know, where's the, ca where's the endpoint to Kafka? What are my credentials for connecting to Kafka if I'm going to do this securely? What about my schema registry endpoint? Uh, how do I shut down the application gracefully? Where do I get my monitoring.properties file? So actually what we're doing is hiding all of this complexity inside an API. So all that code that you would write here on the left, the framework knows about all of these things. It knows the locations. It has a, a service registry. It knows about the certificates. It's copied the certificates out to the, um, to the, task, to the tasks in uh, Spark. And uh, Yarn is going to clean them up when, when it's finished. So basically, all you need to do is say, get me a Spark producer or a Flink producer, and then you can work with it. And the same goes for the, for the consumer. So the consumer will be, look pretty simple. So your programs will come quite nice and, and straightforward, but they're more production ready in that they're handling security. And now you're considering um, all the services that you're going to use uh, as syncs and, and um, you know, these uh, schema registry and, and, and Kafka broker and so on. So the platform, um, we have a lot of people working on it, in, at least in Stockholm, and we're going to produce quite a few uh, new features in the next few months. I'll just give you an introduction to a couple of them. They're mostly aimed at data scientists, so not at streaming. So if you're just interested in streaming, this may not be as relevant for you. Uh, one of them is sharing of data sets globally. So if you have ImageNet, for example, which is a large data set of several hundred gigabytes, and you'd like to get access to it, um, what we'll have here is a way for you to search for that and just download it to your Hopsworks cluster. Um, if you have your own data set you're interested in and you want to publish it, make it available to people, you just right click on it, publish it, and it will become available for anyone else to search for. So it's basically open data um, with a Hadoop back end. Um, we hope that people in TensorFlow will, will look at us as well because we have now support for GPU as a resource in Yarn. Um, we're supporting TensorFlow on Spark, and then we have also a distributed native TensorFlow version running. Um, our file system, we have lots of things going on. Uh, one of them is putting the small files in HDFS, which is a, a quite a um, source of uh, a lot of problems for a lot of people. We're putting them in the database. So any file under a kilobyte will be in memory in the database. And files between one kilobyte and 32 kilobytes we're storing on SSD. 
and uh, the database supports on-column disks, so th that's basically how we're doing it. We're also supporting, um, we're working on, this isn't finished work, but we're working on uh, making the file system highly available across availability zones. So if you um, want to run this on Amazon and you would like to be resilient to a, a, a whole availability zone crashing, um, this might be of interest to you. Similarly, if you're running on-prem and you have two big clusters and you'd like to replicate across them, then this may also be of interest to you. Uh, another thing that we've done related to the uh, file system again is that we have support for Hive and the Hive metadata is typically you'll see in a, in a MySQL database. Well, we're already using a MySQL database. So what we did was we added foreign keys from the Hive metadata to the backing files in HDFS. And what that means is in practice, I don't know if you can see it here, but there's two tables here. One is called website and web sales. And what happens if I do this on the command line, if I go to HDFS and remove the web sales, web sales subtree? Well, if you did that in normal Hive, your Hive will be broken. But in our case, it's just automatically cleaned up because we have strong consistency now for the Hive metadata. So that's what foreign keys give us. OK, so that's, that's basically it. We have, um, I talked about Europe's only Hadoop distribution, Hops Hadoop. It's completely open source, everything, uh, all Apache licensed. And it's not just there for bigger and faster clusters. We're also building a data platform. And uh, in that platform, we're adding first-class support, first support for streaming and Python, amongst other things. And we're agnostic to whether you're interested in Flink or Spark. We love both of them. So lots of people have worked on the project. This is, there's some of them sitting down here. Um, and we have a, a bunch of users and customers. And if you're interested in the project, you can, if you're interested in contributing, just talk to me. If you're interested in doing research on the platform, that's great. Uh, you can also just follow us on, on Twitter, like us on, on GitHub, um, or just talk to us on, uh, on Slack. Thank you. We do have time for one, maybe two questions. I actually have one and a half questions. So uh, first question is, uh, since you want to abstract away um, some of those nitty-gritty details and try to provide this UI where the yeah. user everything does, right? You solved already a number of things like the logging so that they have access to things. Are you also thinking about um, perhaps using Beam as an abstraction layer uh, for, for the programming? Um, um, since I think it would complement because you have mm. solved some of those operational things that are around it now, why not let users also get a little bit away from yeah. those native uh, interfaces? And then the other thing, I just wanted to have confirmation, you can deploy this on cloud and on-prem and yeah. it's completely open source? Yes, we, well, so I'll take a second. When we have automated support for installing this with Chef and we have a, a tool called Caramel. You can click your way to an Amazon cluster. It's about four clicks, I think. Uh, if you're doing it on-prem, you, you just have to have your cluster set up with SSH access into machines, and then this Caramel, uh, which is an orchestration tool for Chef, will run all the Chef cookbooks. Uh, on the other point, Beam, we actually we implemented the interpreter for Beam in Zeppelin because we wanted Beam as a first class. We, 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 th we believed in Beam. I'm not saying we don't believe in it anymore, but we went primarily looking at Beam on Flink. Now, if you're familiar with Beam on Flink, uh, you'll know that um, it only runs in what's called attached mode. That means that the, the Flink client has to be attached while Beam runs there, and uh, it doesn't work in detached mode. Now, the problem with attached mode is that if we were to run that, then we'd have to have Flink's big bunch of jars or dependencies, including uh, Netty, which is a different version which conflicts with our version. So we can't run Flink in, in attached mode as it currently stands. There is a gyra uh, or a flip ongoing for Flink to provide a REST API for Yarn, which would solve this for us. Uh, but it's not there yet, so we'll add it when it's there. Um, Apex, sure, we could do the same thing. You know, it's not it's not much work to add support for for Beam to our platform. It's quite you know it's quite straightforward, and particularly Apex would be easy enough. So we gladly accept uh, PRs and contributions. We'd love that. Okay. Um First, um, we're going to have a break uh, now, half an hour break. Uh, feel free to stay here and continue the discussion, but officially, thank you, Jim, for the presentation. Thanks.